السلام عليكم Hello everybody Today our video about reading lumbar spine radiographs Objectives Introduction Indications for a lumbar spine x-ray Acquire all necessary views Views and adequacy Alignment Interpretation Pathology And the last is summary Introduction Lumbar spine x-rays are one of the most commonly requested radiographic investigations of the spine. However, it should be noted that projectional radiography has limitations and other imaging modalities such as MRI and CT should be considered if further evaluation is required. Indications for a lumbar spine x-ray Appropriate clinical indications for lumbar spine x-ray include Number 1. Significant trauma Not lifting something or bending to keep up something 2. Age less than 20 or greater than 50 3. Past medical history of malignancy including spondylitis or osteoporosis 4. Chronic corticosteroid use Increased risk of fracture. 5. An episode of back pain ongoing for 6 weeks or longer without improvement. Acquire all necessary views. There are two standard projections produced when a lumbar spine x ray is performed lateral and anterior posterior or posterior anterior. In the case of trauma, additional views can be sought, including oblique and horizontal beam lateral views. Views and adequacy Lateral view In a lateral view, the entire lumbar spine should be visible from T12 to S1. Lateral views are particularly useful for identifying fractures each vertebra, highlighted in yellow, should be examined looking for a loss of height which could indicate a compression fracture commonly associated with osteoporosis. Compression fractures are often seen in the upper lumbar or lower thoracic vertebrae. The second view is anterior posterior or posterior anterior. In anterior posterior or posterior anterior view, the entire lumbar spine should be visible from T12 superiorly and the sacrum inferiorly. The spinous process should be central and there should be equal distance between transverse processes. Transverse processes are often obscured by gas from the abdomen. Spinal imaging should be taken erect in the non-trauma setting to give a functional overview of the lumbar spine. Patient with a suspected spinal injury must remain immobilized in the supine position. Alignment There are multiple lines that should be assessed across each of the two typical radiographic views of the lumbar spine anterior posterior, posterior anterior, and lateral. These lines should run uninterrupted in healthy individuals. On the anterior posterior or posterior anterior view, check that the vertebral bodies and the spinous processes are aligned. On the lateral view, check the alignment of the vertebral bodies. Disruption of any of these lines may indicate an underlying fracture. Interpretation A structured approach to lumbar spine X-ray interpretation is essential. Step 1. Assess alignment of the vertebral bodies and the spinal processes, including the lines discussed before and the distance between spinous processes. Step 2. Inspect for loss of vertebral height. The height of the vertebral bodies should be equal in healthy individuals. 
Loss of vertebral height is suggestive of a fracture. Step 3. Inspect the vertebral species. In healthy individuals, the disc height should gradually increase from superior to inferior. Note the L5S1 space is normally slightly narrower than L4L5 space. Step 4. Inspect the vertebral end plates. The continuity of superior and inferior end plates should remain uninterrupted. Step 5. Trace the posterior elements including pedicles, laminae, spinous processes. Ensure the vertebral and spinous process are intact. Pathology Number 1. Fractures When describing and diagnosing spinal fractures, radiologists divide the spinal column into three sections, known as the three-column model. This states that if any two columns are injured, then the injury is unstable. If spinal instability is suspected, further imaging with CT or MRI should be considered. Anterior column involves the anterior two-thirds of the vertebral body, intervertebral disc, and the anterior longitudinal ligament. Middle column involves the posterior aspect of the vertebral body, intervertebral disc, and the posterior longitudinal ligament. Posterior column involves the posterior elements including the lamina, facet joints, spinous processes, and the associated ligaments. Anterior column, anterior compression fracture. An anterior compression fracture is a fracture in which the front part of the vertebral body is crushed, resulting in a wedgy shape. Anterior compression fractures are the most common type of lumbar spine fracture. This picture shows Anteroposterior and lateral projection, depicting loss of the vertebral height in keeping with a vertebral compression fracture. Middle column, burst fracture. A burst fracture occurs when the vertebral body is crushed in all directions simultaneously. For example, sudden axial loading force. This type of fracture can result in bone fragments being projected outwards anteriorly into the spinal canal, causing secondary spinal cord injury. A burst fracture involves two columns and is therefore typically considered to be unstable. This picture shows lateral projection depicting burst fracture evident from multiple fragments of the vertebral body. Posterior column, flexion distraction fracture. Flexion distraction fractures or chance fractures occur when any part of the spinal column breaks away from another part. This type of fracture is often caused by sudden severe compression or rotation of the spine. For example, Use of a lab only seat belt during deceleration injury, resulting in forcible forward flexion of the spine. The result is a fracture of the vertebral body with associated transverse or horizontal fractures of the posterior elements. This type of fracture is unstable and carries a high risk of spinal cord injury. This is lateral projection depicting a chance of fracture evident from the increased distance between the spinous processes. The second pathology is spondylosis. Spondylosis involves degeneration of the intervertebral disc leading to disc space narrowing, endoblade sclerosis, and osteophyte formation. In some cases, Osteophytes can cause neural impingement. The next pathology is spondylolysis. 
Spondylolysis occurs when a fracture, acute or chronic, extends from the inferior facet across the bars interarticularis to the superior facet. This defect can in some cases be bilateral and lead to spondylolysis. Spondylolysis is often best identified on an oblique radiograph appearing to represent a scotty dog. The nose is represented by transversal process. The eye is represented by pedicle. The ear represented by superior facet. Front leg is represented by inferior facet. The neck is represented by pars interarticularis. Collar across the neck is represented by the fracture. The third pathology in our lecture today is spondylolysis. Spondylolysis occurs when one vertebra is displaced forward upon another. This can occur secondary to trauma or as a result of degenerative disease such as osteoarthritis. If severe, it may lead to foraminal stenosis causing nerve root impingement. Then we will come to vertebral bone lesions. Vertebral bone lesions can often be asymptomatic in patients and thus are often identified incidentally. These lesions typically become symptomatic when they present as a pathological fracture with or without neurological deficits, secondary to extension into the spinal cord. Differential diagnosis for a light spinal lesion include prostate cancer metastasis, breast cancer metastasis, thyroid cancer metastasis, renal cell carcinoma metastasis, lung cancer metastasis, and multiple myeloma. This picture is a lateral projection displaying lytic lesions in keeping with vertebral metastasis. The last is the summary. When interpreting a lumbar spine X-ray, remember the following key points. Number one, begin by confirming the patient's details, reviewing the clinical history, and ensuring the radiographs are adequate. Number two, compare to previous X-rays where possible to provide additional context. Number three, Assess alignment of the vertebral bodies and spinous processes carefully for inconsistencies indicative of underlying pathology, for example, fracture. Number four, inspect for loss of vertebral height, which may be indicative of a vertebral fracture. Number five, inspect the vertebral spaces. In healthy individuals, the disc height should gradually increase from superior to inferior. Number six, inspect the vertebral end blades. The continuity of superior and inferior end blades should remain uninterrupted. Number seven, trace the posterior elements, including pedicles, laminae, and spinous processes. Number eight, inspect for signs of fracture and determine how many columns of the three column model are affected to determine fracture stability. Number nine, inspect for other important pathologies such as spondylosis, spondylolysis, spondylolysis, and vertebral body lesions. The last one, number 10, projectional radiography has limitations and other imaging modalities such as MRI and CT should be considered if further evaluation is required.